we get started, people are coming in and um, I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Diane Kunalakis and um, I'm a member of the board of the Pancreatin Association of America, who uh, along with the Pancreatin Youth, which the president Nikos uh, Leodidakis is on as well. Uh, we sponsored the weekend of watching the film Olympia. Um, and we're so glad so many people got a chance to watch it. We had over 175 people sign up um which is fantastic and um uh so we're really excited to have harry mavro michalis um who is the uh, director of the film with us this evening um he just to give you a little bit of background harry is a director writer and producer and obviously he is movie olympia you all watched and he's also working on another film called yankee restraint uh, which is currently in production. And maybe he can talk about that a little bit as well. Um, he hails from uh, Cyprus, from Kipro, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, lives in New York City. And so we'd like to welcome you. Um, like I said, if people have questions, um, please use the chat button and Nico and I will keep an eye on the questions. Uh, feel free to ask Harry any questions you'd like. Um, Harry, do you wanna just um, sort of say hello and, and and maybe the first question i'll ask is really um uh, to get us the conversation going is how you know how did you get involved with this film in, in terms of meeting olympia and putting this together yeah hi everyone um i don't know if uh, everyone's hiding on purpose but if if you could switch your cameras on it would be easier uh to have a conversation if you don't want to that's fine um i am very thankful to be here uh, and talking to everyone. Crete is one of my favorite islands uh, of Greece. I haven't been to all of Crete, but I've been to uh, Hanya a couple of times. Um, and uh, when we went to Lesbos, there was talk of Olympia um, family who basically uh, came from Asia Minor that they had originally had come from Crete and that we found out um, in Lesbos. So um, as far as how did this project came along, um, I had the good fortune of meeting Olympia. Uh, she was supposed to be teaching at NYU when I was doing my master's in film directing. And um, she, the class was canceled a week before it started. And uh, I was devastated because she has been one of my icon, you know, actors that I admired very much. And I really wanted to take class with her. So I um, contacted the head of the department and I said, you know, I would like to invite uh, Olympia to come to Cyprus to teach because I had a production company in Cyprus where I would bring dance and theater shows. And I had just started doing film workshops as well. And um, they forwarded my message to her assistant and then she called me three days later and we met at a Starbucks on Broadway uh, and uh, spoke about it. She said she was interested. I said, I don't know if I can get the money, but I'd love to try. And um, yeah, I went to the uh, Ministry of Culture. They loved the idea and uh, a couple of months later we were in Cyprus and she was doing, she did a workshop with actors and directors and how to work together. Um, which was fascinating for me to watch. So um, we spent two weeks in Cyprus, you know, it was workshop and then sightseeing and dinners. And so I got to know her, she got to know me. Uh, we found out that we actually lived kind of close to each other in, in New York and we kept in contact and we, you know, once a month, twice a month, I would either go for coffee, we'll go for dinner. Um, and I just got to know this incredible woman, because I only knew her as an actor uh, and as a uh, as a movie actor. I didn't even I, I had seen her in one theater show, but I had no idea about her theater background. Um, so little by little, you start getting to know someone and she blew my mind. I couldn't I just couldn't believe how smart she was, how down to earth she was, how straightforward and, and kind and, you know, vulnerable, you know, and uh, 
I think it was a year later, I was at the Tribeca Film Festival and I was watching the Carol Channing documentary. Um, for you, Carol Channing is a Broadway actress. Uh, she did Hello Dolly, that was her big part. And uh, I just, I absolutely fell in love with the, with the documentary. And I, and I turned to my friend and I said, you know, somebody needs to do a documentary on Olympia Dukakis. It really would be an amazing thing to see. And my friend said, well, why don't you do it? You're a filmmaker. And I was like, no, I, I, never, <laughs> I never wanted to m make a documentary. I was very snotty about, you know, I was above documentaries. I wanted to be the next Martin Scorsese. And, um, but I, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, why would I give this idea to anyone else? Um, you know, let me talk to Olympia and see if she would do it. So I went in to her apartment and um, pitched it. And I said all what I thought was all the right things. You know, this is going to be a film about your life and who you are. And you're going to be celebrated and people are going to love you even more. And you're going to come back to the spotlight. And, and she just turned around and she's like, I'm sorry, Harry, but I'm not interested in anything like that. And I was like, what do you mean? You're not interested. And uh, that began a three month journey of me begging and her saying no. <laughs> and every time I would meet with her, I, I would try to find like different reasons why she should do it. You know, I was kind of like mansplaining the whole thing. Like, you know, you should do this because it's good for you. And, um, and then when it finally, it kind of like dawned on me that it wasn't going to happen. I was devastated, you know, and I went to her house and, you know, I had tears in my eye and I said, listen, you know, honestly, I don't care about anything other than, you know, the only reason I wanted to do this was to just spend more time with you. If I do it, I just get to hang out with you more. And she, she got teary eyed and she looked at me and she's like, well, I'll do it for that reason. And you know, it, 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 it speaks to who she is because if you try to show her any like bling bling, she is like, like put off, doesn't want anything to do with it. And then when you open your heart and you just show your true self, that attracts her, which you could tell with the four women in, in Lesbos when she just like, you know, she was the one who went to them. They were never, you know, anyone else, Every time I've seen her in public, anyone who wants to, who tries to approach her, she's very polite, but there's a movement backwards. Whereas with those four women, it was just like a movement forward and wanting to like experience that purity of, you know, those girlfriends sitting on the bench. Um, so that's how it all began. <laughs> So we have a question and I think, and it kind of correlates to something that I was noticing. I, I um, for many of you, I actually saw the film, I guess now it's been over a year um, for the first time when it uh, premiered at the San Francisco Greek Film Festival. Um, and we have sort of had Olympia under our wing for quite a while in San Francisco. Um, obviously Tales of the City was hugely, um, impactful for anyone who lived in the San Francisco area. Um, and her performance was incredible. Um, but also beyond sort of what she did for the LGBTQ community as well, um, she's very involved with the American Conservatory Theater as well. Um, and I actually had a chance to meet her a couple of times um, through connections. Um, she would come to the theater and, and to the ballet, which is where I used to work. Um, so what, what I found interesting in the documentary is the, the way you put the, as you start filming it, um, she is uh, a force in and of herself, correct? Like I, I, I've, because I personally had a chance to, uh, to meet her, I knew sort of the kind of personality she is, but it really shined through on the film. So I thought, the, so the question is, as you put this documentary together and someone else's question was sort of like, was your vision for what the film was going to be? Um, did, it, did it stay in line with what you thought was gonna happen once you started working with her or because of who she is, did it just completely change in, in the dynamic of that? Yeah, um, I had no vision. <laughs> I had zero vision in making this film. I, 
maybe a little bit of a lie. Like I, I had said, I remember saying, um, I just want this film to show, showcase her. I want people to see her the way that I see her. I want people to experience her the way that I experience her because um, I was literally, I had fallen in love with the person of Olympia. Like I was, I admired her so much. And I was like, well, how do I, how do I spend 90 minutes and make someone feel like they know her the way that I do? That was my only vision. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I had never done a documentary before. I did not study any, I did not take any documentary classes in at university because like I said, I was a snob. And um, so I started filming and I was like, you know, I would, I would talk to the personal assistant and I'd be like, okay, what's her schedule for the next year? And he would tell me all the stuff that he, she would be doing. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna film here, 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 and here. It just, whatever felt like, felt right, you know, going to Los Angeles to rehearse and uh, do the play Vigil with the Mark Taper. San Francisco Pride was like, literally she, her birthday, I think is end of June. Pride was in July, I think. So Pride was basically our first shoot in San Francisco where her brother shows up, our Mr. Mopin, who's the author of uh, Tales of the City, shows up out of the unannounced. Um, and so it was, um, I just kept shooting. Year one, you know, second year, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm only gonna shoot two years. And then, you know, it was like, well, she's gonna get a star, Hollywood star, we have to shoot that. And then it's like, oh, she's gonna go with her family in Greece. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> That's going to be big. You know, I, I, I felt certain things that, you know, were going to be big, like the Greece trip, the turtle. As soon as I saw the turtle coming out of the box, I knew, you know, the amphitheater. Um, but we had 200, we had almost 300 hours of footage, which then had to like be trimmed to 100 minutes. Um, and because I was inexperienced and because my editor was inexperienced, it was his first film, my first film uh, documentary. And um, it took us three years to little by little carve. Plus we were running, we kept running out of money. So, you know, you run out of money, you fundraise and, but even if we had the money, I remember going to Sundance a few years ago and it was when the Robin Williams documentary was coming out and the editor um, was there with the director and they asked him, how long did it take? And he said, oh, um, he said, uh, oh, it, it took forever. This, this specific documentary, because it was so much archival stuff, you know, it was all like stuff from television and his appearances. And they're like, well, how, how long did it take? And he said, six months. And I was like, oh my God. At the time, I think I was editing already like a, a year and a half and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> um, but, you know, I did speak to other people who had done similar documentaries, the John Rivers documentary, for example, I spoke to the editor and I said, how long am I supposed to be working on this? And she said, well, because I was looking for an editor and I actually reached out to her to edit and she couldn't. And she said, listen, if anyone tells you six months, she said, run away. Anywhere between nine months and I would say probably 12 months for, because it's not a talking head documentary with a storyline. It's you're trying to figure out the story as you're building the, you know, the scenes and, and, and how does, how do they work together from beginning till the end? So, you know, I think an experience Cinema Verite, you know, director might have taken eight, you know, 18 months. I took double that, three years. <laughs> well, it's a part of your life you will always remember, correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I always say, I always say that it was kind of like doing my PhD in life. Right. On life. You know, like I couldn't, if I could have stayed with her another three years, if I could have afforded to do that, I would have. Um, it was incredible, like seeing how she works, the way she 
like the whole great mother, which I had never heard of that. You know, I had never heard any things that were coming out of her mouth was so new. So of course you're like hungry and thirsty to find out about injustices of our culture that we don't have any control of this. That's how we were, you know, forced to behave with each other and think of each other. Because I remember growing up, I always thought that I was better than girls. Like the girls were always a second, you know, about, uh, below, below me and below all the boys because our parents showed that, society showed that. And then, then there's this dynamic woman who basically just like crashes all your belief systems and educates you in, you know, what the hell is going on and what has happened. And, and, and it's all based, it's not based on opinion, it's based on history. And yeah, so, I mean, that, her relationship to her husband, like, how do I want to be with my, in my relationship? Like, that's, I always think of them, like, that's what I want. I don't want to be like my parents who fight all the time, you know? I want to be like Olympia and Louis, <laughs> who like each other, who laugh, laugh with one another, who tease each other and, you know, and work with each other and respect. Yeah, it was a blessing. Um, I, I feel very blessed. <clears throat> so I have a comment and then a couple questions here. So one of the comments is uh, so many times we being the viewers miss the opportunity to visit with the person and then end up having um, documentaries that are much more in the third person. And what she felt with the documentary that you put together is that it just felt so genuine and she felt so comfortable in the documentary. And anyway, that's kudos to you for making her feel that way um, Thank you. As, a, as a director. Um, so here's a couple questions. Um, it said, um, the moment with the women in Lesbos, uh, this particular person saying it really brought her to tears. And I, I agree with that. Um, how did you manage to capture that emotional moment um, like that as a film director? And the second part of the question is what most surprised you in making in the making of this film? I mean, you've mentioned a couple things before, but um, was, you know, did this, would, I don't know, I'll take it from there. That was the question. Okay. So, um, so what you don't see in the film is that we went to Lesbos for 24 hours um, and we had, gone to Lesbos to visit the house where her father grew up in. We visited the house. There was nothing like the house was there, but there was no, there was no magic in the experience. So as we're coming out from the, the house, um, we're getting ready to switch off the cameras because it's late. We're going to go back to the hotel and there she sees the four women. Uh, if you see, you know, a few seconds before we start filming, the cameras were filming the ground. And we just see her like, just like, boom, like going to these four women. So we're like, oh, you know, let's just, let's just see what happens, you know? So we start shooting and it was mesmerizing. It was mesmerizing because it was, they weren't really talking about anything yet they were talking about so much. And I remember her, you know, walking away, starting to cry. Uh, again, I had turned my camera off and then, you know, she starts crying and I'm like, and I don't want to say anything. So I'm like, <laughs> turn the cameras on. <laughs> You know, she's like crying outside the car. We go in, it, it was just, it was just so magical. And then you start editing the scene and you're in the States and people are not Greek, you know, and you're, I've, I've done about 15 screenings um, at NYU where I would bring people to, some people I knew, some people I didn't. I, I always wanted to have like 15 to 40 people watching the film and then give me feedback, detailed feedback. Uh, and so many times people were like, oh, that scene is so long. You should cut it shorter. 
uh, and I was like, and I would, I pay attention to what people say. That was the only scene that I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you don't understand. <laughs> you, like, if you think I need to cut it shorter, you don't understand. And I'm not cutting it shorter. So when we went on to the our premiere at Dokken YC in New York, she was there, we, it was packed. Um, I was nervous with that scene because I was like, okay, this, this is an American crowd and they're going to be bored out of the brains when, you know, when the women come. And that never happened. That never happened in any screening. People uh, always talk about that scene. What's interesting is that the places where Americans laugh it's completely different where the Greeks left. And I realized that when we went to Thessaloniki and the San Francisco and the Los Angeles Greek Film Festival, where it was like completely different points. And I'll give you an example, which I didn't, it, it never even occurred to me when I was editing it, but there's the scene where Thalia says to Olympia, you've been here before, right? And and Olympia says, yeah, yeah, you remember? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I was just telling my friend about it. The Greek audience went wild. And I was like, and I was taken aback. I was like, what the hell? What the and then I realized for the Greeks, it was like, yeah, we were just gossiping about you <laughs> behind your back, <laughs> you know? And the Greeks put that together, whereas, whereas the Americans would never understand the whole gossip, you know, uh, talking about you as you're, you know, moving around the village. So yeah, it's it's definitely one of my favorite scenes. Um, I recently, you know, tried to find these women and I found out that um, three of the four have passed away, um, which, yeah, which um, devastated me because my whole thing was I wanted Louis and I wanted the four women to see the film before they would pass away. And Louis managed to see a, a so, you know, not a finished, finished cut, but he did manage to see everything. And those women did not. So we have to, our, our goal is to get this film to Lesbos and not just Midilini, but to do actually a little screening for the village. I think there's like, I don't know, 50 people who live there and, and just have like a, you know, in honor for, of, of those four women. That's lovely. Yeah. Oh, what was the other part? So the other part was what surprised you the most, what you um, in making this documentary. What surprised me? Um, I don't. Uh, can we come back to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I was going to say the those four women. I think for all of us Greeks, it, in line with what you said, it and, and and she took the words out of our mouth when she even was very emotional as she was going in the car and she said, "Oh my God, it was like talking to my mom or my you know or my yeah yeah." And that's exactly yeah, yeah. where my yeah. mom. I mean, I could just see those ladies in any village in any place in Greece. So. I thought it was spectacular. Um, someone mentions that they 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 know that her husband did pass away, as you mentioned, in 2018. Um, but when did you when did you begin the actual filming, and when did it end? Then. So we've begun in 2011. We finished in 2014 at the end of 2014, and then it took three years uh, of the editing. And then in 2018, in November, we had our premiere in New York. Then we had a year of film festivals. So that, you know, till basically November of 2019 was the la our last festival. Um, I think San Francisco was either the last one or second to last. Um, and uh, then we were supposed to come out in theaters in March of 2020. And of course, that didn't happen, yeah. So um, someone also asked, what was your strategy towards fundraising? <laughs> the strategy, <laughs> it's so easy to talk <laughs> after the fact. Mm, yes, I had a piece of paper and a pen and I had a great strategy. Uh, <laughs> there was no strategy. Uh, God, the, I, I was so ignorant and so naive. And um, I thought that I was 
going to be able to shoot this film with like, you know, $70,000, like that I could shoot it, edit it, you know, be done. Um, and I started shooting it. I, I, one of the reasons that I decided to do this was in 2011, we had the financial, financial collapse in Greece and Cyprus. I had spent three years writing a script that I had submitted that was gonna be filmed in Cyprus and that I had submitted it to the Ministry of Culture for funding. And 2011, it, the crash happened. So everything froze for years. So I had spent three years basically wasting my time writing the script that couldn't happen anywhere else. And so I felt, you know, um, artistically, I was feeling suffocated. I was like, you know, because writing is, is not that creative. I mean, it is creative, but you are sitting alone in, an, in front of your desk and it's like, ugh. So part of me doing, wanting to do this documentary was to basically like breathe again, you know? And um, it was, um, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Sorry. Um, it was, we started talking about your strategy of how to fundraise. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So thank you, thank you. So I managed to go with her. I had, there was a team of two, me doing the sound and my cameraman who was on deferred pay. That means that you don't get paid until we make money. And so our only expenses was airfare, Airbnb, food, you know, equipment, hard drives. So I was able to pay for everything with my American Express. I always joke around that American Express sponsored the film <laughs> for three years. And then editing started, needed to happen. And again, because I was naive, I didn't understand the different kinds of documentaries. I hired an Emmy award-winning editor who I thought, you know, we agreed on a price. I think it was like $30,000 that he was going to edit this film. He had never, he, he, he is a Ken Burns editor. He's won an Emmy for Ken Burns, right? And I had, was very specific with him that I do not want a Ken Burns documentary. What I'm looking for is more in the line of Carol Channing, uh, John Rivers, you know, those documentaries. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, don't worry about it. Well, Seven months later, I haven't seen anything, nothing to show me. Seven months later, he shows me the first five minutes of what he did. And it was basically a Ken Burns documentary. There was none of my footage in there was photographs. And, and I, you know, I was like, well, what is this? What is this? So I, I, like, I, I wrote him a detailed letter of like, you know, two pages of like notes you know, instead of saying, I hate this, this is terrible. I'm like, let me be constructive with my criticism, you know, and I tell him all my concerns and he writes back and he goes, well, I don't understand why you didn't like it. Everybody in my office loved it. So I said, okay, we're not on the same page. Let's move on. And that's when I embarked on the journey of, you know, finding editors who did similar documentaries. And then I find out from the editor of the John Rivers documentary that, you know, nine to 12 months at least to finish the film, you're paying editors anywhere between two and a half thousand to ten thousand dollars a week to edit. Um, so I was like, okay, this is never going to be done. Like, <laughs> so the strategy was how do we find money? And usually, um, you know, you do a Kickstarter campaign, but you usually do it at the end. But I didn't have any money. So we we reached out to, you know, the Greek community. We reached out to whoever we, you know, we felt we knew that had money. Nothing was happening. Um, so we did a Kickstarter campaign. And we, with Kickstarter, you, you basically choose the amount. And if you don't reach the amount, you lose everything. So we chose $100,000. And it was a month and a half where I think my hair turned white during that month and a half. Um, <clears throat> it was crazy. And we 
reach um, one hour before the thing is ending and we're at $80,076, something like that. So we were $20,000 short. And so I'm talking to my producers on the phone and I'm like, okay, let's prepare a letter that we're gonna send to all our supporters. Because at the time there were about 250 people who gave money to the film. And we're gonna thank them and say that, you know, we'll go to Indiegogo, a different platform, and maybe you can help us, you know, through there, but this is, you know. And literally like 10 minutes before the thing ended, this Greek guy from Greece gives $20,000 and <laughs> scream, like we were like, what? <laughs> and that was the first magical part um, that happened. So we were able to start. And then once you have Kickstarter and you have like, you know, 300 people who supported your film, you have, you know, your confidence goes up and you're like, okay, everyone, like, there's people who believe in this project. It's not just me, I'm not crazy here. Uh, so then we started getting uh, grants, a lot of um, little grants here and there, 8,000, you know. We did a fundraiser in San Francisco and we did a fundraiser in Montclair that raised, you know, very little money, um, but money that was needed. And we found out that um, there's a trust that was called the Agnes Virus Trust. Agnes Virus was this woman who was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, like Olympia, a year before Olympia. She was the 12th daughter uh, of this Greek American family, the only one that was educated, who then went into chemical, like uh, chemical company, became a billionaire, and um, had all this money and then she basically is responsible for generic drugs. She was the one that brought generic drugs to the United States because she felt everyone should have access to, you know, medicine. She's the one who created the $12 uh, tickets for the Met at the opera because she felt like everybody should have access to the opera. Um, she was a very influential woman and then she died of cancer and left all her money to three guys, two, Jewish man and a Greek American and said, I want you to spend all my money on the arts, animals, politics, and I don't know what else. It was like four things that she loved. So we found out that, and you cannot apply for, for, for money. You have to be invited to apply. So we found out that uh, they had given money to this magnet school in Brooklyn, which is a, a school that basically is based on um, Greek, the ancient language, you know, ancient Greek and the literature and the place. And it's amazing because it's an amazing school because it accepts kids from all over the state. And it's all these like African-American and Latino kids all speaking Greek and learning about Greek culture. It's, it's magical. So anyway, they, they give all this money to build a theater in the school and they were gonna, uh, you know, presented to the school. So we sneaked into the event with my producer, who's a Greek American. And Thul, you know, Anthula Katsima did this. Um, and she, like, you know, zeroed in on him and started talking to him and then invited me over. And uh, his wife comes, who's Italian. And he's, you know, she says, This is Harry. He's, we're doing a documentary on Olympia Dukakis. And he says, Oh, I've been Olympia Dukakis a few years ago. And I said, oh, I said, where did you meet her? And he said, oh, it was the most bizarre place. It was, it was somewhere in Greece and there was this turtle that they were gonna release in the wild. And I'm going, what, what? And I'm like, going, kuch, 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 kuch. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is this? And then I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I said, I remember you, I remember you. I filmed you, I have you on film. You're like, you're the guy that, was, because there was a guy that sh she kept doing banter with a limp, like him and her were bantering about the turtle. Like, oh, look, you know, she's like craving attention. Like the turtle, talking about the turtle and they were laughing. And, you know, there was a lot of like back and forth. So there was a connection, right? I continued talking to his wife. His wife said, um, why don't you send us an application? 
Two weeks later, oh, I came home. I found the footage. I created this little scene between him and her. I sent it with my application. And two weeks later, we had $53,000 from Agnes Byers. Yeah. Wow. Another magical, like, moment. Um, so that, that was that was constantly happening, like just, you know, little here, little there. Um, yeah. I mean, we still, haven't, we still haven't paid off. We still need money, you know? So we're hoping that with the sale of the film that that money will come. I haven't gotten paid. I, you know, uh, none of my producers have gotten paid. It's the only people who got paid are the editor, you know, and anyone we hired as a cameraman, you know, and all that stuff. Labor of love. Yeah. yeah. And great place for the turtle, Costa Novarino. I've actually been there. I recognize the, uh, the flapping, uh, right? <laughs> where they released the turtle. So I, yeah. that was exciting to see that. So we have two more questions. Um, and then we're gonna do a little contest where we're giving away a couple of the films uh, uh, of the Olympia film to people who have seen it. And I also got a copy of Moonstruck because we all love that movie anyway. So I, yeah. I know, so uh, we're gonna give those out. Um, so let me uh, get to these two questions. And then I just kind of want to ask you your what's happening next for you and for the film. So the first question um, is: There's a we have a member who's making a documentary now, actually, um, and she it's about all the wines of Crete, and um, she's in post production. And she's just asking, what advice do you have for a first time documentary filmmaker? Um, I think my my number one advice would be to try and find someone who has done a similar film and have a heart to heart conversation about pitfalls. What should I be looking you know, for? Um, you, try to get as much knowledge from someone else um, so you don't make this, you know, the same mistakes because like I said I just for me it was like one mistake after the next mistake and it was mistakes that that were either costing money or um well actually money because even like with the quality of the first editor it actually you know did cost money um and um the other thing is you have to be very open for critique before you finish the film. What, I, I, what helped the film get to where it is, is those 15 screenings where people would be like really honest and you know, oh, the, this was boring or da 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 And you just take it in, you write it down, you figure out which work, which are, they have a point and which they don't. But every time I, I've known a lot of directors who are very afraid and very insecure to, be that vulnerable. And I would say, take a good lesson from Olympia, who at, you know, 80 years old is so vulnerable and, you know, and so afraid of, be afraid, but be brave, you know? And um, I think that's it. That's the two that's, pieces of advice. That's fantastic, actually. Um, so the other question is, um, in reference to what you were talking about, the type of film that you were going to make um, in Cyprus. Uh, the question was, was it a documentary? And were you glad you did the documentary on Olympia instead? Uh, that's back, I guess, going to 2011, correct? You said that was when you were working on it. And have you been able to return to doing that original film that you intended to do in Cyprus? So, um, no, it wasn't a documentary. Um, it was a, a narrative film uh, that was about a group of nuns who did amazing knitwear. And they, uh, so, sorry, it was two, two older women who were doing knitwear selling it to a, a group of nuns who had factories all over Cyprus for like a clothing line. And at some point the nuns disappeared owing money to these two women because they had dealings with the mafia, the nuns. And so these two older women go on a road trip to try and find the nuns and get their money back. And so it's a kind of like a coming of age um, story about these older women. Um, 
I sitting down now, yes, I would, I'm so glad that Olympia <laughs> happened instead of that, because if I had gotten the money for that, there's no way that I would have done Olympia. Um, and that's a great thing. You know, I always have to remind myself that any problem that comes along, comes along for a good reason. You might not know it at the moment. Um, it might throw you in a very dark place, but I, I do believe that the universe has a way of, you know, guiding you when you have um, a goal. Um, I did not go back to the script. I do want to get back to it eventually, um, but I had read it many years later and I was like, oh, it felt, I, I was fresh out of, you know, university. I didn't have the experience. It, it felt not ready, you know? So I put it in the drawer until a later date. Let's see. Um, one other thing here. It's mentioned a few times in the film that Olympia is a perfectionist. Is she punctual as well? Or does she have that Greek trait of being late and keeping people waiting? No, sir. No. She is on time. And what I've always loved about her is that when she goes to start rehearsal on a play with people that are not as successful and as you know, famous as she is, she, the first day she walks into the play, she knows all her lines. And everybody else is trying to like figure out, you know, their lines as they're going along. Olympia knows the whole play by heart. I mean, her, her lines and the lines that come in before and after her. Um, I mean, she had had the accident in, in New York where the truck almost hit her and she had the black eye and broke her hand, flew to LA four days later to start rehearsal on Vigil. Um, and she was learning Greek, a Greek, she was gonna do social security, which um, was the play that she did on Broadway that Norman Jewison did, uh, saw her in to, and casted her on Moonstruck. She was gonna do that play in Greek in Cyprus. Um, and so she was le learning everything in Greek and she doesn't read Greek. So it was all like in English characters. She doesn't speak very good Greek. So it would people had to explain to her. She, that's the kind of person that Olympia is with her work. I mean, um, I think if you were her kids and you were gonna get picked up from school probably she wasn't that much of a perfectionist <laughs> and uh, would be late. But, it, you know, it's like, you know, work is one thing. And then her life, she allowed her life to fall apart a little bit, you know. So the little but bit of chaos, as uh, yeah. Zorba the Greek said, right? A little bit of chaos is okay, right? In yeah. your life, as Gazantakis yeah. once wrote. So maybe she followed exactly. that as well, right? Um, she did. She did. Yeah. But we can only do... You know so much <laughs> right right she I, what and was the, and the, go ahead i was going to say the one thing that we didn't manage to put in the film you know when she talks about regrets and how she felt like she could have been a better mother um or oh, louis had a really bad act, car accident that the, he had a broadway show this colleague of his said let me drive you back instead of taking the bus so they drove back, a car hit them, and he was in the hospital for six months and he was in bed for three years. And um, all of a sudden, Olympia had to have three jobs. That's when she started teaching at NYU. She had the theater company that, you know, that she was running and whatever else was coming in, she had to make do. And she, she talked about how there was a, a sign up sheet on the fridge. And if you as a kid, didn't put down that you had to be there or here or get picked up, it wasn't happening. And so she's very hard on herself. She wanted, you know, talking about wanting to be, but she also forgets that when you're trying to bring money in and, and feed your family and not lose the house uh, for so many years and you don't have any help from anyone else, then certain things will go, you know, 
be left behind and, or forgotten for a little, you know, yeah. Um, so I'm, um, I'm gonna do this little spinning wheel for a second and then I'm going to come back to you and ask you to tell us about the next steps for the film um, and if whatever else you want to tell us uh, that you wanted to share. I did want to note, uh, I noticed, and I'm sure most of the Cretans that watched it this weekend was the book that she referred to when God was a woman and the slide that you put up is actually of the Minoan goddess um, from the, you know, Knossos time period. Um, so I don't know for, it was, anyway, I went on Amazon and ordered that book immediately anyway so i'm looking I forward think, to i think everyone it. should i think everyone should read that book yeah honestly. okay so let me share the screen hold on everybody just gonna go real quick watch this little nifty little thing i'm gonna do here um and here it comes okay so we are going to spin the wheel so we have three move four movies we're giving away so our first winner, I'll have to see whose email that is. Okay. All right, here we go. Second one. Okay, Deanne. Okay. Get this nifty little thing here, huh? I love names. Well, I know who that is. That's Tina. Okay. She continues to be a winner every year, every time we do this. I, and the fourth and final one. Okay. All right. Noticing all the great uh, emails that you're seeing there, nice Cretan names. <laughs> so, um, I, I, that would be my last question is really um, what, where can we see the film to tell our friends? What else can we do to help promote the film? Um, sure. Thank sure. you for the uh, honor of showing the film um, to all of our members and let us know, I'll, I'll let you answer that. Um, yeah, for me, it's very important that as many people as possible see this film. So um, we have, taken a delay on bringing the film out so we could do screenings like this. We're doing a lot of organizational screenings and we're also doing corporate screenings and university. Um, so anyone that has to do with like Greek culture, LGBTQ, women's empowerment, um, theater, film, acting, um, we, we're having a, a a lot of success with that. So if you know any organizations that might be, you know, interested in this, put us in contact. Um, the film is coming out on iTunes, Google Play, and some other like uh, what they call transactional uh, video on demand, TVOD, on the 23rd of March. So you will be able to rent the film on the 23rd. If you go on our website, uh, which is olympiathefilm.com, um, or or our Facebook page, Olympia the Film, um, then you'll, you know, we'll be announcing, you know, closer to the to the premiere on the 23rd of March, and we're still, you know, pitching to Netflix and Hulu and PBS and all the other stuff. Um, so I don't know. All I know right now is for the 23rd of March. That's the next step. Yeah, That's and fantastic. and DVDs. By the way, you are the only people who have DVDs. Like we are, we DVDs are not available for anyone else. Oh wow! Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So we we. Wow, these winners we, have something very special. Then. No, they do. No, I mean, yeah. the the family doesn't have DVDs. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, we're we're gonna wait till the twenty third of uh, March to get the the word out for, for DVDs. That's fantastic. Yeah, so, and for the winners, um, they're actually autographed by Harry as well too, which is very nice. So thank you for doing that. Um, I wish I could have got them <laughs> autographed by Olympia, but it was, it's, it's been tough. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I also wanted to let our members know that we actually um, had an advanced preview of the film and we were able to give it to um, one of our writers in the Kriti magazine who is, has done a film review and it'll be coming out in our February, March issue. 
Um, and in that uh, magazine, it also lists the date for the release on iTunes and um, also to your website and, and such. And so uh, that's going to go to all of our members. Yeah. So, um, oh, I have a note here that says, have him send me information. I can tell you who that is, Kelly. Um, and she can present it to the Hellenic Museum of Michigan. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So I'll get I'll get that name to and, uh, and, Kelly. Uh, who, um, Krista, are you the one doing, doing the wine? Yeah. Um, get my information and, and yes, I would be happy to do that. Great. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you personally. I look forward to meeting you one day when I get back to New York City, um, <laughs> hopefully sooner than later. I want to thank Nico um, Leodakis, who is the youth president for also promoting this among our youth members. He's on there right now. Looks like he's driving in the car. Uh, <laughs> And uh, everyone else who's on, uh, we will be uploading this video along with uh, two more videos from our uh, two previous um, virtual events onto our website so that if people missed it tonight, they can click and watch it uh, and watch this Q&A. Um, and we'll have a little information there about where people can see the film and again, a link to your website and, and hopefully people can continue to help you. So. And thank you for taking the time. I, you know, I don't know what time where you are, where you're all at, but you know, I think it's late, and I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to come join. Well, thank you again. Uh, thank you to Kelly and Anthula and you, and thank you to all the members again. And on that note, I will say good night. <laughs>